I remember, we had a problem on uh, at when last Wednesday that we just had gotten part way through, and that was this idea of a ballistic rocket of some kind was shot such that right at the peak it underwent an explosion and broke into two halves. The explosion and the halves and the orientation and everything was such that one piece immediately came to a stop. You know, so it was it was kind of at the back end of whatever this rocket was, so when it exploded, instead of going forward anymore, it immediately came to a stop, and then of course just dropped right from there. The other piece, and the two pieces were equal in mass, the other piece continued on such that it went somewhere else and we're not sure where. Unfortunately, this is the kind of thing they did a couple years ago with the Columbia explosion. Remember that? That one of the space shuttles was coming back and started to break up over California, I think, and then really broke up over Texas. And so they had to look at the, the pattern of where things were scattered to try to figure out where pieces were going to be. And they were looking over a two and a three state area for pieces. And by pieces, they really meant pieces, as gruesome as, as some of that was. And uh, I understand for the, uh, they, they had a lot of astronauts who were doing the looking themselves, a lot of astronauts were on the ground because they understood that some of what could be found could be very emotional. They are also worried about people gathering stuff up for, for souvenirs and stuff. People do that. So uh, they had a lot of astronauts out there trying to help, and that definitely was very, very emotionally trying, as you can imagine, doing this forensic work. Uh, but this is the kind of thing they looked at. They had to look at it. But, based upon the size and the pattern and everything, they knew where to look for a better chance of finding stuff and where to not bother looking because there just wasn't a good chance of finding stuff there. So we're keeping it simple. Two, piece, uh, two pieces after explosion. I gave you, uh, I think I only gave you two things. One is at explosion, the altitude was 10, 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth meters. And I think I gave you the horizontal component of velocity only. Is that right? Yeah. Those are the only two things I gave you. And that was 5 times 10 to the third, 5,000 meters per second. My question to you then was, and remember this was a ballistic projectile. We talked about that, right? Remember what that means when I say it was a ballistic projectile? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was no, uh, no thrust or anything to make it fly the way it was. It was just a simple, just like the projectile motion you'd see when you, you threw a ball. Um, I don't know how many of you could throw 5,000 meters per second uh, to an altitude of 25,000 meters itself, but I could. All right, so the question was, one half of it lands here. Where's the other half land? That was my question. This is like the collisions we were looking at, only in reverse. Instead of two things coming together to become one, and from that we figured out what was going on after the collision, this is one thing then becomes two, and we want to figure out what happens after a collision. So you probably sat all weekend thinking about it, to the exclusion of all else? And how'd you get? How far'd you get on it? 
pretty far. Pretty far. <laughs> but you're ready to go look. What's the deal? What what's what governs what we're doing here? Usually when we say what governs, we mean what physics principle and or equation. Because usually our equations come from our principles. What have we been looking at for the last couple days? Let's start there. You gotta figure it's gonna apply since I gave it to you during one of those days. We're looking at conservation of momentum. Where did that come from? And does it apply here? Where did the conservation of momentum come from? We actually got to it two ways. I remember the, the first thing we were just laying out uh, collisions and the like and what happens during them. But then uh, I took it a step farther on Wednesday and that also came right to conservation momentum. What did you write down on Wednesday? Besides energy. Uh, we had conservation of energy. Uh, couldn't expect it to be conserved here, as I'll talk about in a second. Uh, sometimes conservation of energy is very useful to us. Remember, though, it wasn't in those type of things where two things collide and stick. Con energy, at least kinetic energy, was not conserved, was it? And that was really all the only type of energy we had. We just had two things moving. We didn't look at anything in a gravitational field until now. And con uh, so energy was not conserved earlier. This is kind of the same thing running backwards. It's one thing that now becomes two. There were, we got to this from the fact that there were no outside forces. But then I formalized that on Wednesday. I actually gave you an equation that links the outside forces, if there are any, with the momentum. And since we sometimes don't have any outside forces, as we didn't in our collisions, then the momentum was conserved. And it all came out of that very same equation that I gave you on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> Too late. Well, Impulse huh? Impulse momentum. Do we do that on Wednesday? Yeah. Did I just do it for Len all by himself? We have the impulse momentum equation. We actually got into part of it with our first work on collisions and then got to the rest of it on Wednesday. What was the impulse momentum equation? What's the impulse? Some of the forces comes the change in time. Outside forces. The sum of the forces times the amount of time they work. However long those forces are being applied is the impulse. Well, that's just the area under a force time graph if we happen to have it. If we have a force that changes with time, that integral is simply the area under it. Uh, for most of our things, though, um, uh, the forces are constant, then you just finish that interval by pulling the forces out. That's the uh, left-hand side. What's the right-hand side? <coughs> well, more completely, it's the change in 
momentum. And our first collisions were such that there were no outside forces. That's what this is here, any outside forces. There were no outside forces, so we had right from the start with our collisions that momentum was conserved. Now we can do a little bit more completely if we need to. Uh, if, the, if there are outside forces and we have some idea how long they apply, then we can figure out how much momentum is uh, going to change. Or if we can observe how much momentum changes, we can figure out how much impulse there was that brought that about. And then we talked about individual car crashes um, in that light. And so hopefully you all went home with your seatbelts on and your airbags intact. Joey, did you? I don't believe you. All right. So we have this ballistic projectile that then explodes. No reason this shield shouldn't govern it. Uh, this actually governs, governs anything we, we've been talking about, because remember that came directly from F equals MA. Anyway, it's not, not like this works and that doesn't. It's just F equals MA in a slightly different form that's a little more useful to us. It allowed us to see uh, why very small times and crashes lead to very big forces that kill people sometimes. So we have this projectile that goes up here and explodes. What is the impulse sign? Who said that? John, you said that? Want to admit to it now? Taking it back. Take it back. Got it. Got it. Wait. It's got weight to it. That's, that's an outside force. But remember what we're talking about in these problems here is the instant of collision. When we were talking about the two cars hitting, it was the instant before collision to the instant after the collision. Very, very little time went by, if any at all. So in that time, gravity's not going to act in any significant way. So let's just ignore it. Because remember, we're only talking about the instant of these collisions. So, are there any outside forces? Well, what about this gigantic explosion? Something on board blew up, you know, an oxygen tank was leaking, or, or, uh, or a fat astronaut brother-in-law belched or something, which would easily blow a ship apart. So we have this thing go along and there's some external there's some some internal explosion on board, but does that count as an external force? And we need to take into account, then we can figure out what's going on for the rest of this. That internal explosion is really fundamentally no different than our car collision run backwards. Because whatever explosion there is, it's equally felt by the two halves. It's internal to the ship, and since it's equal on either side, it's going to be equal and opposite and cancel. So that's, a, that's as good an example as a, of an internal set of forces as, as we're going to see. So we can take then for uh, an internal, something catastrophic happened on board, we can take that the internal forces are zero. Now, that's of course not the case if it had been shot by something, some kind of ground air missile. But that's not what we're talking about here. So, momentum must be conserved then for this problem. Momentum of what must be conserved? Well, you said the system. You said center, center mass. mass. Oh, no, Which one's right? Oh, you switch now? Oh, I said the same thing. I just had something. You buy that? Is it, or is that like him trying to jump on board your wonderful answer? 
to try to make his answer system. all shiny. He's at the center of mass of the system. Let's put it to the rest of everybody. He said momentum of the system was conserved. He said momentum of the center of mass was conserved, but then tried to try to hop on board over here because he thought, well, maybe that sounded better. And then he's now he's backpedaling and scrambling and saying, but they're the same thing. What? What are you looking at? <laughs> well, system momentum is conserved, center of mass momentum is conserved. If you don't know which one's right, who do you like better? John better or Alan better? Should we do the applause meter? Only in the one. You don't want to do that because you don't know if you might not be next, huh? I can take a ring on. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of them is right? Momentum, the system momentum is conserved. The center of mass momentum is conserved. Both? Yeah. See, you like John better, but you're afraid Alan can beat you up. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Worse things than that make people vote for president. A lot worse than that. Phil, what do you think? Momentum of the system is conserved or momentum of the center of mass is conserved? They're both right. There's, there's, there's no difference because uh, we get to all the same thing anyway. In fact, if you remember when I first showed you how to calculate the location of the center of mass, what did I do with that equation? You remember? Took the time derivative of it, and you got the velocity of the center of mass equation, which was just conservation of momentum. So whatever momentum the system has going into this is the same momentum it has coming out of that. Or, if we look at it the way Alan put it, the momentum of the center of mass. What does the center of mass do in this whole thing? Let's say, let's say, uh, remember this is all ballistic, so after the explosion there's no applied power in any way for these things. Let's say that this piece has had enough time to drop down to there. Where's the other piece? Some constant delay. So let's see. Maybe, maybe if we uh, let's draw a big picture of the two instantly after explosion. So here's their projectile, their their, their path, their trajectory takes them up to there. Let's see. The, the pink one's the one that drops straight down. The blue one is the one. What does it? What does it do? Immediately after explosion. Remember, this one is brought completely to a stop, and then starts to drop from there. So if this one is brought completely to a stop, what happens to the upper one? Maybe it would help if the pictures were more like this. So that when the explosion goes off, it makes it look like the pink one comes to a stop, the blue one. What's it do? Continues on in what way? It has all the same direction. See, they start 
with, we'll call it 2M, so each one of them has 1M after explosion. They had how much momentum just before explosion? They had zero momentum or 2MV, whatever, you said VX even? Just before explosion, right here, explosion hadn't happened yet, what was their speed? This, remember, is the launch speed I gave you. I gave you the X component, the launch speed. What's their X velocity at this moment? Zero? At this instant, they still have velocity of Vx. Remember, that's what we learned about projectile motion. The x velocity does not change. There's nothing to change it. So right before collision, I mean explosion, the system momentum was just what you said, 2MBX. Right? Just what John said. Then there's an explosion. What's the momentum after explosion? You're going to split it up into two pieces. No. Nope. Is that what I asked? What's the momentum after explosion? There was nothing that would change it. Remember, this is the system momentum. System momentum is the same afterward because there was no external force to change that momentum. So afterwards, and we've used the designation prime to signify after the event, it's also going to be 2MVX. Comfortable with that? Why not? What would change it? No, I know. For some reason in my brain, it's just not. You have to, well, the, the governing equation, put it back up there. If this is zero, this must be zero. If that's zero, those two must be the same. No matter what your mind tells you. Your mind hasn't taken physics. It's just now taking physics. So if this piece, this pink piece, is brought to a stop. Remember I said the explosion was such that it was instantly brought to the stop. It's kind of the back half of the craft. So when it blows up, the explosion brings it to a stop. Bless you. What then is the velocity of the other piece that keeps going? 10,000. Well, do it. Give it to us in terms of V. That's at 10,000 meters per second. Give it to us in terms of V. Say, oh, Vx. Nope. What, 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 v to the Vx. In the x direction? V1. Okay, that piece starts to drop. This piece will go where? What will its velocity be? The blue piece, the, the, the pink piece has a velocity right after explosion of zero. What's the explosion of the blue piece right after explosion? It's got to be 2Vx. If the system momentum is 2MVx, one of the M's has zero velocity, the other must have the 2V velocity to give them the same momentum before and after. So this P, and in what direction? It's got to be in the same direction. Remember, this is a vector quantity. So we have to have not only the same direction on the moment, or magnitude on the momentum, we've got to have the same direction too. So the blue piece 
will now have two Vx to it. So that yellow was just before explosion, the pink and the blue is just after explosion. So, uh, so let's let a little bit of time go by like we are doing here. The pink one's dropped down to here. The blue one is going to start to drop, isn't it? Where will it be in relation to this one? This one started its fall with zero velocity at the same instant this one had horizontal velocity of 2v. Where will the pink one, the blue one, be in relation to this one? Is there anything we could tell? Same height from the ground. Why is that? They have the same vertical acceleration. So they're always going to be at the same height. When the explosion went off, they were at the same height. They're going to always stay at the same height. So the blue one will be somewhere on that same level. Sometime later, the pink one will have fallen to here. The blue one will be somewhere on that same level because they have the same vertical acceleration. And they started with the same vertical velocity. They've got to always be at the same vertical height. It couldn't be any other way. Can we figure out where? Well, let's go back to what Alan said, where he said the center of mass, the momentum of the center of mass would be conserved, which is the same thing as saying the momentum of the system is conserved. Because there are no external forces, the momentum is conserved, whether you look at it as the system or the center of mass. Well, where does the center of mass go then? When they're together, each of them and the center of mass are all doing the same thing. Then they reach up here in an explosion such that the momentum of the center of mass does not change. So what does the center of mass do after the explosion? It takes the very same path it would have taken as if there had never been an explosion. because there was nothing done to alter the path of the center of mass. No external force. So the center of mass does exactly what it was going to do before. So if at this height, there's the pink piece, the same mass as the blue piece, where's the blue piece? twice as far away from the center of mass path such that the center of mass, mass does just what it was going to do before. <laughs> Is that funny? He's laughing because I said center of mass. Right? It's not funny. Did you write down center of math? Yeah. You're good, because that's what I said. You better write down what I say. Equidistant on either side of the center of mass are the two pieces. Because they have the same mass. If they didn't have the same mass, the center of mass wouldn't be right in between. But it is. When the pink piece reaches here, where's the blue piece at the same instant?
Now that wasn't funny. I mean, he's not even laughing. And he'll laugh at anything. He wasn't listening. That's why he's not laughing. He wasn't listening. When the pink piece is now here, where's the blue piece at the same instant? What's the distance in the center right now? Twice as far away. There's the scientific way to do it. It's going to follow a path. Something like that. So, if this is L, from the launch to where we find the first piece, where's the second piece going to be? A total of 3L away. Because we know that the center of mass would have done right in between, would have made a nice symmetric launch, would have been 2L in base, and so half that extra will locate the blue piece then. Which lands with the blue butt. That could be useful because it also works the other way around if we have a collision. There's nothing saying we couldn't shoot these two pieces and they join here. That's what they do to fall. To fall. In a collision or in an explosion, which is a backwards collision, the path of the center of mass in the absence of any external forces, like our collisions are, the path of the center of mass will remain unchanged. Our system changes because it was just this whatever the object was and then now the system's a lot bigger and the system's a lot bigger but the path of the center of mass does not change. There wasn't anything to change it. When there are external forces, not not under the chapter heading of collisions, no. Uh, however, if you have a collision between two objects, just look at one of them, and then you'll be able to see what you can do. In fact, we can do that. Let's look at well. I could let you. I could let you figure out exactly where that is because you know enough about projectile motion to figure out what L is from what you were given here. I hope. Because we did projectile motion months ago now, not even weeks. So we'll do a collision problem now and then I'll show you how you can do the no external, or the, the forces aren't. Uh, there are external forces. All right. So let's uh, let's look at a, a collision. As could typically happen on a city street where the streets are at 90 degrees to each other. So here's one car, 1,200 kilograms. Collides with another car that was going 90 degrees to it. 3,000 kilograms. So, must be a Cadillac or something. The Hummer. What else is that big? Fifty kilometers per hour. Happen to know that? You know, some of these cars have black boxes on them now, so we can get the speed at impact. Skid marks go off at about fifty-nine degrees. What was 
is the speed of this car? Uh, you know it already? No, do we need a distance on the skid mark? What the wheelbase of the car is? Uh, no, how long we are from where they start to uh, Eight miles. Yeah. So 59 degrees to the horizontal requirement path. Well, not horizontal. We're we're looking from above. This is these are city streets here. Our, uh, but 59 degrees to the original direction of this car where the skid marks whether that's north south or east west or something doesn't matter as long as you know that's 59 degrees so what was the speed of that car we'll call that one and that two Do you have enough to figure it out? Assuming they they collided and stuck together for the most part, which they might not actually do, but they could certainly hit, kind of be side by side each other and go in the same same direction. You know? External forces. sitting watching it and then drive into the parking lot and the professor could just pull up to you and say, hey, saw you texting back there, you fat head. Risk my life. You never know who's going to be watching. Not that you guys are fat heads.
so you kind of that, that's like moving a checkers piece but keeping your hand on it you know I may need to back up here Phil Mike you guys agree Phil how you doing yeah well I'm used to the spring hat you're in spring bonnet Easter bonnet wait what you say that Well, maybe it's a red arrow. Maybe it's something that gave you the problem you don't need. You're using your specialty. You know the direction here, but not the magnitude. Right. So, however big that is, determines that 59 degrees. If that guy's moving faster than a certain speed, it'll be less than 59 degrees. If he's moving less than 59, a certain speed, it'll be greater than 59. He's moving such a speed that, what is that 59 degrees? Did you use it? Len, did you use it? No. No? This is gonna be very interesting. Did you use it? No? Did you use it? Did you? Phil, did you use it? Did you use the 59 degrees? Did you? <laughs> what is the 59 degrees, Phil? What's it tell you now in this problem? Sure, it's the skid marks, but what's it tell you in this problem? No, no, in, in terms of the collision, remember the, the collision is just two things. If you, if you don't want to draw the cars, you draw them as little masses. What's the 59 degrees in terms of the problem that we need to solve now? We, what, what's the equation we have that works here? What's the equation? Of course you can set up a right triangle. Hell, anytime you have 90 degrees, momentum. you can set up a right triangle. Momentum. What about momentum? Momentum is not an equation. Uh, um, momentum equals uh, mass times velocity. Well, darn it, that's an equation. I'm not even going to write it down. That's a definition. Well, so you have... 3, no, no, no. I don't want to start putting numbers in until I have some place to put numbers. I can't just do mass times velocity. I won't have anything. I, I only have mass and velocity for one thing. What good is that? Don't calculate something just because you can. Calculate something because you need to. It takes you somewhere. Phil? Uh, 3, I don't want numbers because I don't even know where to put numbers. There's nowhere here to put any numbers. Nobody's given me anything. It's a collision. Therefore, what? Huh? Momentum is conserved. That's something I can write down and do something with. Momentum of what? The system. The system. <laughs> now it wasn't hard, was it? Still don't have any place to put the 3,000 whatevers. Momentum of the system was conserved. So let's figure out the momentum of the system before the collision. What is it? M1, V1, and these are vectors because V1 and V2 are in completely different directions. Plus M2, M2, V2. Now we have all of that one. We don't have the magnitude here. We do know the direction, we just don't know the magnitude. Well, that's what we're supposed to find. What else? Equals. 
Equals. Good guess as any. I'm one plus I'm two times two. Now they stick together. They're one object. The mass of that one object is m one m two times times what? V prime. V prime. A velocity after collision. And remember, this is a full vector equation. We don't know the magnitude of V1. We're supposed to find that. Is there anything else we don't know? The direction or the magnitude or both? Uh, just the magnitude. What do you mean? Well, we the What's the direction? You told me you didn't use that. I never said I never used that. Oh. I thought you did. I said he, I use it. You didn't use it. Sorry, Mike. You didn't use it. A couple others said so too. You said you didn't use it. You were mad at me for something. <laughs> you, you used it. We don't know the magnitude of V prime. Uh, we weren't asked to find it. So we may not need to find it, but we don't have it anyway. But we do have the direction. And yes, you do need that because it's a full vector equation and you're going to need that now. So now what? Plug like in what you know. Huh? Plug like it in. All right. M1, 1,200 kilograms. See, now there's a place to put some numbers. Before, you guys, 3,000, put it somewhere. Quick. Uh, what do I write in for V1? V1. What? V1. That's not enough. Minus. No. Vector. How do I do that? It's a vector. Vector vector. Don't we kind of have a nice orthogonal coordinate system being laid out here itself? Let's use x and y direction or ij vectors, unit vectors. So v1 i. I. May sound trivial, that's going to help in a second. What's V2? Uh, sorry, M2, V2. 3,000 kilograms, 13.9 meters per second. Why not 50 kilometers per hour? Do that too. If we do this in 50 kilometers per hour, then that'll be in 50 in kilometers per hour, which We'll match. We'll instantly know which one is speed without having to make any conversions. 50 kilometers per hour. What? J. J. That's the momentum before collision. of the system. It must equal the momentum of the system afterwards. What's that look like? Well, M1 plus M2 is what? 4200. What's the velocity afterwards? We don't know the magnitude, but we know the direction. So, it's got some x component some y component that we can put in here. 
V prime, we don't know what it is, times cosine 59 for the x direction, cosine 59 i. plus sine 59j. That's the momentum of the system afterwards. And they're equal. Why are they equal? No external forces. Collision. Internal forces, big internal forces on each one, but no external forces. Now how do we solve it? Now what do we do? Now what? We know that the I components on this side had better match the I components on that side, or they're not equal. Does that make sense? So, in the I direction, 1200 kilograms V1. Now, this we know is going to be kilogram kilometers per hour. must equal the I components on the other side. 4,200 cosine 59 V prime. True or false? Mike, you okay with that or he does not? Oh, I, I just did but, uh, that's the way I asked. Oh, it's good. I just asked true or false. Notice two unknowns though, so you need another equation. So we looked at the J direction. 3,000 times 50 equals 42 V prime sine 59. How many unknowns? One unknown. Oh, 4,200. So you can get V prime from there. We didn't need it, but it was something we have to come up with because we're going to need it there to find V1. So what's the speed after collision? 41.6 kilometers per hour. Kilometers, yeah. 41.7, a little under 42. Now you can use that in the first equation to find V1. Remember all vector equations are really two equations so we can solve for two unknowns. So V1 is seventy-five point one. It's no coincidence that happens to be the car you were driving. 75 kilometers per hour on city streets. What is? John wasn't in that because he's an adult. So if like one hit a ramp and did like a Dukes of Hazard fly, and the other one, and the other one, and then you just 
add like a C. Um, yeah, you just do the very same thing, only in three direction. These become three dimensional vectors, and you do I, J, J and K directions. Now, maybe you looked at it some other way than that, but hopefully that's what you came up with either way. Is that what you got, Mike? Yeah. If I walk back here, I'd see that? Yeah, right. Let's call him up. Well, it's well, of course you have it now. You wrote it down. One one. That's me for second. What's that? Oh, okay. Optional <laughs> units. <laughs> All right. Okay. But then, now, any questions with this before I do something else with it? Now, what we could do, too, is if we didn't know either one of these speeds, we could have measured the length of the skid marks if we'd known the coefficient of friction. Could have backed that up to get the velocity immediately after collision. And then use that to get the two velocities. And then we could see if either one of them was locked. <coughs> Clearly, me and vehicle two was doing a, a nice, safe job. Going on up there, Alan. Uh, party or red light? light? Huh? She got a red light. I don't think so. Stop sign. <coughs> right there, stop sign. You didn't see it, but there it was. That's why you ran it. You didn't see it. Okay. John, though, you asked a different question a little bit ago that I said we could do after we did this one. What'd you ask? Remember? Yeah. What did, let's factor in some external forces. Okay. Let's do the same problem. Just look at one of the vehicles now. There's vehicle one. We now know its speed to be what? 75. Round it off a little bit, make it easy. gets in a collision goes off at 59 degrees and was it going this speed as well right after collision yes. same collision we're just looking at one car instead of both Do we know anything about its speed after the collision? Joe? Yeah, it was like Yeah, it, it was this. That's what that speed was. That was the two of them together now. So it's going at, uh, we'll call that 42. Yep. Isn't that actually just the speed of the boots on our passing system? I mean, that sure. This car could actually be flying on bird. Oh, no, no, we'll put three dimensions in it. Well, well, more. It could be, this card isn't necessarily going in that direction. Just the center mass of the system is. No, no, no. Right. Well, uh, yeah, card. except for that's what I said. I said they stuck together. Okay. So if they stuck together, then wherever they go, that's where the center of mass goes because they're one of the same. Okay. The question then is, What was the impulse on car one? Is it zero? Is it zero? Because I said that in collisions there are no external forces. If there are no external forces, there's no impulse. Is that true here? If so, we're all done. And then you vote for that. And let's go. 
Is the impulse zero here? And if not, why not? No. Why not? There had to be something acting out to make it feel that way. We're looking at only one car. This car most certainly had an external force on it. It came from car two, which we've pulled out of this problem, though not let anything else change. So how can we find out what the impulse was on two? I'm uh, sorry, on one. What's the change in time? What's the force? Well, yeah, that's not the impulse side. That's the momentum side. Oh, right. But yeah. aren't they equal? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to. So the impulse, which we don't know either part of, but we do know that whatever that impulse is has got to be the same as the change in velocity because the same in momentum because that's what it causes. Notice impulse itself is a vector. So it's going to have direction and magnitude. See, now that we know, hang on, we've got to fix things here because now that we know that car was speeding, we know what color it was too. It was red. What? Does that mean you have to do a separate impulse right. for, the, for the vertical or the other direction? No, it's the sum of the force. It, it doesn't matter. It's a vector. Right, but that's only mm -hmm. x direction, right? No. This is a vector, whether it's two or even three dimensions, this holds. Okay. So you know this side in two dimensions because you know its velocity coming in and you know its velocity going out. And that must equal the impulse. So to find this side, you don't do anything over here. You do this side because they're equal. What was the mass? 1,200 kilograms. Man, I'd much rather be in that class than this one. They're having fun. Do you know anybody in that class, Joe? Some, is it chemistry? Geology? Could be geology. I've taken geology. It's not that fun. What's the change in velocity? Well, it's not just the magnitudes. These are vectors. So it's V2 minus V1. Remember, V after minus V before. V after is 42 kilometers per hour times cosine 49i. Sorry, 59 plus the sine. Plus sine 59j. That is all V2, sorry, V prime for car one. V1 prime. That whole thing is V1 prime after collision. We subtract from it. V1 before collision, 75i.
All right, so we're going to have a, uh, we've got an I component here that we add to that I component. So I'll bring it up here now. We'll just say the impulse on car one. Actually, it's a vector. Who's got this for 1,200, 42, cosine 59, minus 1,275, I, the whole thing. Because we have an I component here, and then another piece of it down there, they both get the 1,200. So you can subtract from this, that, and then multiply by 1,200 once and so on. And I'm, I need a couple people to do this because I don't have this number written down. I'm doing this in response to John's question. Negative 20,000. Okay, I'll write it down, but I want to see if somebody can confirm it. 20,000 is close enough? Yes. Yeah. Okay, 20,000, and that's kilogram, kilometer, hours. We might want to change that to newtons, just because that is a more normal force. Speed is fine in kilometer per hour, but that's pretty goofy for newtons. I mean, newton seconds. Anybody else confirm that? Close up, that's I. And the J part, which is 1,242 sine 59. Yeah. For the whole thing? Yeah. Even the I's and the J's added together? No, no. Disregarding them. Oh, yeah. It's not negative. No. 20,000. I got negative. I bet it's negative. Knowing what I'm looking for, I'll bet it's negative. You got what? Negative 64,000. <laughs> 42 dynamic cos 59 minus 75. Got to be minus. Well, the the minus then times 1200. That's negative 64. Yeah, that's negative 64. All right. Sorry. It's a negative 64 thousand dollar question. That's what just happened to you. That's the I part. And it's negative. What's the J part? Which has got to be positive. There's no negatives there. 43 dollars. Same units. Confirmed on that 43,000? Somebody? Joey, you got it? Okay. Let's see what this means then. At least according to the equation, that's the impulse. So right in, at the collision, which is right there, right at the collision, car one saw a force or an impulse that was Minus 64,000i plus 4,000j. So let's see. Minus 64,000, those units, plus 43,000. So it's going to be about that size, give or take a little bit. Would a force like that or an 
impulse like that, would an impulse like that, which is the same direction as the force, because the time isn't going to change the direction, would an impulse like that cause an object to go like that? Yeah, wouldn't you think so? If, if we just hit it from the side, it might do that too. But uh, the fact that it was essentially a dead object in the X direction that it hit also gave us enough uh, for this whole thing then to be that 59 degrees that we knew it. So that's all you need to do when we have external forces. If we know the change in momentum, we can find out what the impulse was. If we knew maybe from, uh, you know, maybe at that intersection there was a video camera running, we can get an estimate of how long they were actually in the collision, which would be just split second. We could then estimate what the total force was. The total impact, remember, we're only looking at the collision itself. As people, we consider the skid out of it as part of the collision, but as physicists looking at a collision, we're only looking at that instant of collision, which is a very, very short time, very, very high forces then, because this impulse is going to be pretty big. So you, you, you would ignore friction or something like that. really don't need it. Well, no, it sounds to me like you're dying for a problem. I'm just saying, like, it wouldn't No, be. no, it's too late. We <laughs> can't get out of it now. We got five minutes here. It's so small. Do you have time for another question? No. No more questions. Here we go. Two cars. That's good. Two in a bus. Car in a bus. That one's going that fast. Oh wait, I have the number switch, so just to make sure they don't get worse anywhere else. Let's go back to two and one there. So this is V2. V1 is like that. M1, 900 kilograms. M2, same car as before, 1,200 kilograms. Just got, just got just driving home from the auto body shop after the first collision. What a loser. V1, V1 is 14 meters per second. They hit and skid off in that direction. And you can even hear them. Oh, oh they skidded, yeah, they skidded then, because somebody said they saw, no, no, they skidded before the collision? That's what I thought I just heard. That means these velocities are different. You have to change the whole problem. They skid, hit and skid, skid marks are 17.4 meters long and the road and weather conditions were such that the coefficient of friction that be kinetic or static? Kinetic. kinetic. Because the tires are moving in relation to the road surface. 0.85. Find V2. Don't have that information, so there you go. When you get that, you can leave. If you 
get it early, you already got an A plus, you can go. Yep, that's all you get. Either way, whatever these are, this, the velocity of the center of mass wouldn't change. The velocity of the center of mass of the system wouldn't change. So if we happen to know what V1 was, we know what the two masses are, we know where the center of mass is, we could possibly figure out that. We'll see how you do with it million dollars to whoever comes with the answer on Wednesday. And that's a million dollars for every one of you who get it. So if somebody gets it, sell it to the other people for 500000 we all make out. Unless you're wrong. That's going to suck.